to worship at First United Methodist Church. Actually, today we are at Hooker Field here in Martinsville. We're going to be talking about God and the spirituality of baseball. I want to thank George Lyle for making it possible for us to be here by making all of the requisite uh, connections for us. We're going to follow the rules of the field. Please do not spit seeds, gum, or tobacco products on the turf. We're going to live by that today. Uh, we've also got our United Methodist beverages over in this corner. So we are all set. Time to play ball. Thanks for being here for worship this morning. Will you join me in reading responsively our call to worship? God grant me wisdom to tell a strike from a ball, to know where to throw and never to fall. God be my strength when I throw the ball, when I'm far from home plate or against a wall. When I help younger players, let me always give praise so they'll see you in me in all of my ways. Let me take a loss just as well as a win. To do any less is surely a sin. However my games end, let me always have fun. And if heaven has all stars, I want to be one. When my games here are over and my seasons are done, let me play on your team just like your son. Amen. Just Lord. 
join me in our opening prayer. This is a responsive prayer. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, giver of all good gifts. In your goodness you created human beings in your image and called us good. You gave us a garden to sustain us and to be our delight. Even when we broke your commandment and lost that first paradise, you gave us the gift of Sabbath reminding us that we are not slaves to our work or to anyone else. You commanded us to rest and to play. You put playfulness in the hearts of your creatures. Dogs run, dolphins jump, birds sing, children run, jump, and sing. And you bid us to participate in that joy. In time, baseball developed in the midst of that play invented by children and by adults who wanted to keep on playing. It doesn't really do much that's particularly useful, but along with chocolate, swing sets, symphony orchestras, rose gardens, and blueberry pancakes, not to mention the final four and red bow ties, we are grateful for this gift. We are thankful for those who taught and coached us, and those who encouraged us to play games, for those with whom we have played and those with whom we have watched games, for teams that we have loved and teams that have broken our hearts, for bats and well-oiled gloves, new baseballs and softballs and baseball cards, for hot dogs, peanuts, and Cracker Jacks, for ballparks and playgrounds and those who have built and maintained them, for games broadcast on the radio and on television, for Little League and the Angel League, for Field of Dreams, Bull Durham, and a league of their own, for Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron, Lou Gehrig, Ted Williams, Stan Musial, Jackie Robinson, Cal Ripken, Chipper Jones, Derek Jeter, and Bryce Harper, for Dorothy Kamenschek, Doris Sams, and the rest of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, and for all who inspire us and elevate the game of baseball and of life. We pray for the following, in repentance for racism and other forms of bigotry that have plagued the game and excluded people who deserve to play, for those who teach and coach young children that they may do so with love and compassion, that they may remember that baseball is a game and that children are children. For all those who wish to play, especially those with disabilities, that they may find the opportunity to do so. Blessed are you, Lord our God, giver of all good gifts, for you have given us play, including baseball. Amen. Now I'd like to invite the children's attention for the children's time. I've got on my Martinsville Mustangs hat that Mark Crabtree gave to me. The sun is actually right overhead, so it's helping me to not squint while I talk to you. Uh, we are in the home dugout here at Hooker Field in Martinsville. And I wanted to talk with you this morning about the difference between a fan and a follower. Now, a fan is somebody who cheers someone on from the bleachers, somebody who roots for their team, somebody who yells out encouragement to their favorite player. And a follower is something a little bit different. A follower is somebody who doesn't stay in the bleachers, but actually gets on the field, actually puts into practice what they think is important in life. So. In Jesus' day, when he was about his public ministry in Galilee, 
Jesus had a lot of fans, lots of them. Lots of people loved to come hear him teach. Lots of people saw him perform miracles. Um, we know from the feeding of the 5,000 and that they were only counting the men, not the women and children, that he drew huge crowds of people to hear him. But he didn't have as many followers. He had lots of fans and he didn't have a lot of followers. Because in order to follow Jesus, you really do have to try to follow his teachings, try to follow in his footsteps, try to walk where he walked, try to do what he taught us to do. Um, we all try to be followers of Jesus. We listen to his teachings and then we try to do what he taught us to do. We try to love people even when that's hard. We try to forgive people even when that's hard. We try to give of ourselves in many different ways. And it, it can be hard at times. It truly, truly can. Um, but Jesus doesn't really need fans in the bleachers. He needs followers. If he is going to help us to uh, create a more just and more loving community in which to live. So I really would like you to think about that this week. I really would like you to think about the difference between being a fan and being a follower. And think about how, you know, you might be a fan of a specific baseball team or player, but you're a follower of Jesus. And that means getting on the field and doing what he calls you to do. Thanks for joining me this morning. Holy God, word made flesh. Let us come to this word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas. Banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations. We know that you can, we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. Amen. Our New Testament lesson this morning is found in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, beginning with the first verse. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarded its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is found in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, beginning with the first verse. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, amen. A few years ago, I think it was 2013, baseball's opening day fell on Easter Sunday. I don't know how often that happens, but as you know, Easter moves around, it's always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. But that particular confluence of opening day and Easter Sunday caused a lot of clergy and commentators to reflect on the twining of spirituality and baseball. Doris Kearns Goodwin remarked that baseball and the spiritual journey have much in common. Prayers, altars, sacred space, faith, doubt, conversions, miracles, blessings, curses, saints and sinners. And that storytelling is crucial to both baseball and one's spiritual life. Seasonal ceremonies of birth and renewal figure largely in both realms, as do rituals, traditions, and superstitions. 
E.J. Dion, in an op-ed piece in the Washington Post that particular Easter morning, wrote this. Baseball, as it turns out, is a wonderful laboratory to those seeking to develop their capacities for contemplation and mystical intensity. He also quoted a book titled, Baseball as a Road to God, Seeing Beyond the Game, a book by John Sexton with Thomas Oliphant and Peter Schwartz, upon which he based his op-ed, Reflections, and upon which I base mine. It is a good read and I highly recommend it. Sexton is a university president, I believe of NYU, and has for a number of years taught a popular course by the same title. He uses language throughout his book which can only be described as liturgical. Here's one example as Sexton begins to make his point. Today, as for thousands of years, it is possible to find meaning beyond words everywhere. And in, and in this domain beyond words, the religious or spiritual resides. In an age of gigabytes and picoseconds, we tend to live too quickly and to miss much that we might see. Baseball, as it turns out, can help us develop the capacity to see through to another sacred space. Indeed, the more we come to appreciate the sport's intricacies and evocative power, the clearer it is that it shares much, much with what we traditionally have called religion. While his statement may seem over the top to some, Sexton at least avoids the superficial similarities that might make a mocking of the twining of spirituality in baseball. He doesn't list trinities like, like three strikes to an out or three outs to an inning or evoke the beauty of the grass created for the outfield or compare the arc of a rainbow to the arc of a high arching fly ball. He does not exist, insist, as does the character Annie in the movie Bull Durham, that there are 180, 108 beads on a Catholic rosary and 108 stitches on an official baseball, neither of which is actually true. Sexton actually goes much deeper than that, maintaining that the ineffable, ineffable that which lies beyond words, in both religious practice and in baseball is experienced, not defined. Thus, he doesn't ever equate baseball in the spiritual life. He simply states that baseball awakens awareness of spiritual truths that provide con connection to his religious practice and to God. I can't take issue with that. If, as Paul calls us to do, we are to pray without ceasing, then all of life should yield spiritual truths that provide connection to our religious practice and experience of God. No moment is devoid of the sacred. God is everywhere, all the time. Religious life has its sacred times and places. The church's year begins in late November or early December with the first Sunday of Advent and concludes each November with Christ the King Sunday. We keep time differently in the church, if only to remind ourselves that all time is God's time. We have special days such as Christmas, Epiphany, Easter, Pentecost, and All Saints, and we have special seasons like Advent, Epiphany, and Lent. In between those seasons, we have a long stretch of time known as ordinary time. Others keep time their own way too. For example, school calendars start in the fall and end at the beginning of the summer. Well, baseball keeps its own time too. Sexton writes, while the teams and players on the field may change each autumn, the game's evocative power is continuous. Opening day in the spring and the World Series in the fall are the bookends of baseball's liturgical time. And within the rituals of each season, fans are converted to believers, players, managers, and even owners become saints or sinners. 
and events become part of a mythology, forever remembered and repeated with the solemnity of the most beloved sacred stories. And inevitably, each season, begin, each season brings its moments of heightened awareness in which some discover a connection to something deeper than the ordinary. For Sexton, as well as for Christians engaged in the ways we keep time, the reason for keeping time differently is exactly to heighten our awareness that there's more going on than just what's going on. Cyclical liturgical time is marked by ritual and ceremony. Sexton says that baseball operates out of ordinary time. The length of an inning or a game is not set by a clock. Neither do we set a time limit on God's activity. Sacred places feature in both realms as well. One of my colleagues in ministry used to have a picture from a periodical, the Christian Century, had this picture framed and, and hung prominently in his office, and it was the drawing of a, an altar on which communion was set, and the altar was set in a squash court. Needless to say, it was quite a conversation piece, and the conversation about the conversation was all about what makes a space sacred. Is a cathedral a more sacred place than a mountaintop, a prison cell, a squash court? What makes a space holy? If God is everywhere all the time, then a sacred place is one which awakens us to God's presence and activity. And it could be anywhere, and it's probably different for every person. Sexton talks about a stadium's majesty, not because of its size or grandeur, but because of the stories that happen here. From Wrigley to Forbes to Fenway, stadiums have history and they serve as reminders of where one's grandfather or his father might have been, places where they came to root and celebrate and to grieve and to bond with the team and with one another. We come to church for a lot of the same reasons, to celebrate and to grieve and to bond with God and with one another. Two more characteristics of both baseball and the religious life are starting points and vantage points. In the Wesleyan theology, the Wesleyan theology, the starting point is grace. God loving us from the very moment we came into being. John Wesley called that prevenient grace, which means the grace that comes before. It's why we practice infant baptism. It's how we understand God to begin a lifelong synergistic conversation with us in which God speaks or acts and we then respond. But we start always with God loving us, not because we deserve God's love or because we can earn it, but because God chooses to gift us with his love from the very beginning. Throughout our lives, God assists us with his grace, which brings us into right relationship with him. We call that justifying grace. And then he offers sanctifying grace, which assists us in our efforts to grow on our Christian journey. Baseball has grace moments too, and they start at the very beginning. On opening day, the slate is clean. No matter what last season's record, all are now tied at zero wins and zero losses. And it continues. As the saying goes, it ain't over till it's over. Baseball is driven by routines and statistics, but what makes it exciting is the unexpected. You can be down in the ninth with two outs and still come back to win it. Every pitch is a new opportunity. Vantage point matters too. The gospel sounds different depending upon where you are when you hear it, whether you're up or you're down, whether you're an insider or an outsider, powerful or powerless. Blessed are the poor in spirit might mean nothing to one person, but provide a lot of solace for another. God turns things upside down all the time. And often all the things we work so hard to earn and achieve don't matter so much to him. 
vantage point matters in baseball too. Sexton writes, in baseball as in religion, it is often very difficult to see through another, another person's eyes. Ecstasy for some is agony for others. He cites the autumn of 1951 when New York Giants Bobby Thompson hit his historic three-run home run to cap one of the most unlikely comebacks ever and abruptly end the Dodgers season, a moment when his heart sank while, all, while those of, of the friends all around him soared to inexpressible heights. Now, if you know a lot about biblical characters, you know that God likes to work through and with the most surprising people. Almost every prophet tries to give God some, some other names of more suitable people to do the job that he's calling them to do. And no one would have guessed when they were boys that Eli or David or Joseph were going to be powerful vehicles for God's kingdom. If you read the Bible, you know that you can never count out the bit player or the outsider. In the lives of many biblical figures, in the parables Jesus tells, in the life of Jesus himself even, God is full of plot twists. Well, in baseball, that's true too. That's why W.P. Kinsella, in his book, The Iowa Baseball Confederacy, counsels fans to watch a different player every inning. It takes a lot of years watching baseball not to follow the ball every second. The true beauty of the game is the ebb and flow of the fielders, the kaleidoscopic arrangements and rearrangements of the players in response to a foul ball, an extra base hit, or an attempted stolen base. Two final facets of baseball in the spiritual life bear consideration. Saints and community. On All Saints Sunday each year, we lift up the names of those from our community of faith who have joined the church eternal during the year. Each time we celebrate Holy Communion, we talk about joining with a great cloud of witnesses because the boundaries of time and death are unknown to God and thus through him, we remain connected to all those who are and have been witnesses to us. Consequently, I was moved by Sexton's recollection of September 6, 1995, when Baltimore's Oriole Park at Camden Yards erupted in a 22-minute long ovation in honor of Cal Ripken, who had just played his 2,131st consecutive game, beating a record thought unassailable. The ovation was for Ripken, but it was also a nod to the quiet dignity of Lou Gehrig, the previous record holder. And now the two are forever entwined. Finally, community is so important to the spiritual life that God actually exists in community, in the community of the Trinity. Jesus chose disciples. He sent them out two by two. And he encouraged them, as Paul did later, to create communities that modeled and expressed his vision of love and justice, mercy and peace. Well, churches do that too. They bring disparate people together. And Sexton says that baseball does that too. It has the capacity to elevate and transform, that it has the power to bring people together in expanding levels of relationship parent and child, neighbor and friend, community and city, state and nation. On some majestic summer days, the many who assemble are one, he writes. Now, <clears throat> I will be displeased if anyone goes home following worship and announces that the pastor said in this morning's worship service that going to a baseball game is just the same as going to church. I am not arguing that baseball is a religious event, but I do think that faith and all of life intersect, and our awareness of that which transcends us is awakened in many different ways. If baseball gets you living a little slower, noticing a little more, embracing life's ineffable beauty, 
know that those things are also things called for by the spiritual life. If baseball enables you to recognize the power of community, the connections between people, the gifts and talents with which each of us is uniquely imbued, know that those are things that are also called for by the spiritual life. Finally, I have to say that I love that baseball is a game in which the goal is to go home, to get to home plate. Augustine said that our hearts are restless until they find rest in God, until they find a home in God. So that is our goal too, to find our way home, a present and a future goal. Thanks be to God. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come again to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now with the boldness of children of God, let us pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
should be And now may you go forth in peace to love and to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. And the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and always. Go forth, First United Methodist Church team. Amen. Gag the ball around the infield. You lollygag your way down to first. You lollygag in and out of the dugout. Do you know what that makes you? Larry? Lollygag. Lollygag.